I'm talking to Michaela Rong, who is the author of three books on Africa in the footsteps of Mr. Kurtz about the Democratic Republic of Congo. I didn't do it for you about Eritrea, and it's our turn to eat, which is about Kenya. You've spent 18 years writing about Africa. What, what is it that's drawn you to write about this subject for that period of time? I think one of the things that's very attractive if you're a journalist uh, writing about Africa is the immediacy of the experiences. Because I had spent nine years working in Europe. Uh, I've been to, based in France, based in Italy, and also obviously in Britain. And you're always uh, going through press offices or you know, press releases form a large part of your experience. Um, uh, and conf yeah, press conferences. Um, and the whole, the, the joy of working in Africa is um, sometimes you're in situations where either you see it or it didn't happen. You talk to a rebel leader directly. Um, it's not varnished, it's not watered down, it's not mediated, there's not layer and layer upon layer of mediation. And that's, it just makes it so much more interesting and also makes you feel that the role you're playing is more important because if you weren't there, um, the words in some cases would not get out. I want to turn to um, your book, uh, It's Our Turn to Eat, and at the heart of that book is a kind of knot of corruption which forms one thread of the book. How was the money being taken out and who was it going to? Well there was a, a, quite a simple principle involved in Anglo leasing and um, what, what that's had, the corruption scandal we're talking about yes it was called Anglo leasing it was a nickname and it came to apply to 18 different contracts but the initial contract that people uncovered um, was uh, was Anglo leasing after a passport company that was supposedly set up in Liverpool um, that really was just a shop front and address nothing more um, and there were a series of military deals security deals uh, where inflated contracts were being signed, there was no public tendering, there was no com competition. Um, for things like um, naval frigates, um, prison telecommunication systems, passport systems, they were always this uh, military security side of things. Um, and then the money would be paid out immediately by the Kenyan government, by the Treasury, uh, and disappear. Uh, and um, then They were security contracts presumably to avoid procurement procedures. Yes, I mean, uh, the military area is a favourite area for corruption because um, the lack of scrutiny by parliamentary um, uh, committees or by MPs can be justified on the grounds that this is military, this is national security, so it has to be kept secret, you can't tender openly. Um, uh, these deals, the Anglo leasing deals, were being signed. They amounted to about a billion dollars at the end. Um, that was the calculation that was made. Um, and very little came back. I mean, some things were delivered. We gather that there is a naval frigate somewhere sitting in Spain, um, but they, didn't, they certainly didn't cost the amount of money that was being paid. And what was very suspicious always was that the money was paid immediately up front um, so, before anything was delivered. So the suspicion is that, in fact, given that sort of very little of it was delivered, that the largest part of a billion pounds went into the politicians' pockets? Yes, that uh, very little came back. Um, most of it was being rechanneled back into probably Swiss bank accounts and Canary Island shell companies. Um, uh, and uh, what was, uh, of course, the giveaway was that uh, Anglo leasing uh, did not exist when questions were asked about who are these people, who are these, these companies that these contracts have been signed with. Uh, it turned out that they, there was nobody. It was the ghost of Anglo leasing. These mm. ghostly presences, uh, these Kenyan Asian uh, middlemen uh, played a key role in sort of fixing facilitators. facilitators. Yeah. And, and that's a long tradition in Kenya as well. Yeah. Um, and so it was all incredibly murky uh, and has remained murky to this day. And are the same people involved who were involved in these corruption cases still in power? Uh, some are. Um, uh, one of the key uh, figures in the John Githongo uh, story, or maybe I should say one of the key figures in the Anglo leasing scam, because we haven't yet talked mm. about John, uh, is, um, was uh, Kiraita Murungi, the energy minister today. He was justice minister at the time. And uh, he was actually exposed on the BBC um, trying to blackmail um, uh, John Githongo, the anti corruption czar of the day and asking him to stop his investigations. So he uh, certainly hasn't paid a price for his, his role in trying to cover up Anglo leasing. Um, the other two ministers involved have, um, 
have been sidelined. But there was certainly never any punishment. Nobody's gone to jail. Nobody's, you know, ended up in court. I mean, it's basically been total impunity. And the, there's a number of people who are involved in the earlier scandal, which was called the Goldenberg scandal, and those, those people are still sort of up and running in terms of being in power in various positions. Yes. Goldenberg was a previous generation of scandal. It was the Moy uh, era, uh, Daniel R. Moy, uh, whereas Anglo leasing uh, took place under Moy Kibaki, who came into power in 2002. Um, and Goldenberg was sort of monstrous, a, m a monstrous scandal that sort of many people calculate caused a 10 year, 15 year recession in Kenya and involved fictitious exports of, of gold that uh, Kenya's never had gold to export. Um, and um, the, the, one of the ministers whose name has always been linked as, as having allowed that uh, corruption at the very at least to take place under his watch uh, is Minister for Internal Security today. Um, so yes, I mean what you see is this pattern in which ministers who are clearly involved in, in massive scandals where uh, money is just sort of funneled out of the mm. treasury uh, are never punished and in fact they're rewarded and reinstated and given more and more important roles in government. And does this corruption involve um, working across different ethnic groups, tribes as it were? Well I think this is one of the key issues um, that uh, you, what you tend to see in Kenya is these sort of rotating cliques, um, uh, ethnic cliques uh, seizing power and uh, under President Daniel Arat Moy uh, it was a Kalenjin clique, uh, one of the smaller ethnic communities and of course because he was it was a smaller group he had his sort of allies in other ethnic communities um, but in 2002 when he lost the elections or rather his successor mm. his appointed successor lost the elections um, uh, what you see is the return uh, it's seen in the eyes of many Kenyans as the return of the Kikuyu uh, this, this very strong uh, mm. economically dominant group and with it a sort of looting that, take, that begins to take place. Hence the title of the book, It's Our Turn It's Our to Turn eat. to Eat, yeah. because that was very much seen as what was taking place, and that's very much seen as the philosophy by which Kenya and so many other African countries have been run, which is your ethnic community uh, with its affiliates hmm. gets in, and then your businessmen uh, loot uh, uh, because they've got friends in government who are from that ethnic group and your constituencies do well and the contracts are doled out and there are jobs for the boys and in all sorts of parastatals and ministerial departments and that's really yes it's our turn to eat. Mm. And is this corruption in Kenya purely governmental or does it affect other parts of life? Well I think um, anyone who's lived in Kenya and um, many uh, other African countries are like this but not all uh, would say that it affects every aspect of your life. I mean when you go through a, a, a sort of round a roundabout and you're sitting in a in a in a matatu, one of the taxis, a public taxi, um, there, there'll be a roadblock. The police will stop. They'll ask for their bribe. You'll see very openly a bribe being exchanged with the driver. Uh, Any time you need any kind of documentation issued, um, uh, and and I think it's it's very insidious. You know, your contracts tend to. You know, there are sweeteners paid by the private sector to get contracts done, if you need a land registry deal. And I think, you know, what you see is, I, I recount in my book how, you know, I discovered mm. that, you know, my office manager was scamming me. And then, you know, uh, before that, I had discovered that everyone in the press center where I worked, all the journalists, the foreign journalists who worked there, they were all being scammed by mm. their office managers as well. And it's all because if you have no example um, if, if everyone does this, if this is sort of justified in the grounds of, well, this is the way the system works, and if you don't do this, you're a fool, mm. uh, and you won't survive, and if you don't do it, someone else will, uh, and if that's the way that at the top of the chain, you, you see your president, your mm. minister, you know, even your church leader often mm. behaving, you're going to do the same thing, because why should you be the only honest fool? How, how does... How does a country transition out of a corrupt state into a less corrupt state or to being hardly a corrupt state at all? Because it happens historically, yeah, doesn't it? Yeah, I think that's such a big question and I think so many people are trying to work it out and they're partly looking at examples and case histories and you know, if we knew an easy answer then it would be uh, 
uh, there wouldn't be uh, so many problems. I, I think one of the conclusions that John Kathongo reached in Kenya, and I would certainly echo him, um, is there's, there's often an idea that if you set up an anti-corruption commission, uh, it sorts things out. And in fact, that doesn't work. Uh, because all you do is uh, you create a new layer of um, sort of legal bureaucracy and then all these games are played that what will tend to happen is the president will appoint uh, one of his cronies to run that commission and then the... Com the or the, the enemies of the president will... Yes, and there's a lot of... out with will be charged. The, yes, exactly. There's, yeah. there's a sense of, you know, it's victor's justice and, uh, the, uh, and then the crony will take an awful long time to bring charges against politically sensitive individuals, and then his files will be rejected by the Attorney General as being incomplete and bounced back to him. And it's a sort of game that takes place. Um, and people who are at this kind of level of society uh, and influence can hire very, very good lawyers. So I don't think that's the answer. I mm. think it's a sort of colossal red herring and waste of time, and very costly. Um, uh, because all these people are getting very large salaries to do nothing. Um, John is firmly of the belief that you have to have sort of grassroots up, you know, bottom up mm. uh, action. And I think some of the things that we saw maybe uh, that Obama describes in his own book about the work he was doing when he was a young politician, um, uh, of making your own MPs, your councillors accountable you know, asking to see the accounts, mm. insisting on on budgets being published. Um, and the internet have, can play a huge role in this and is being used for this in Kenya. Um, you know, just information is a great tool and then using that information, the spread of the private media, all these play a factor, but of course they're all tiny little elements in a bigger mm. picture. You, you have to create a climate where people feel ashamed to yeah. do a certain things. That's quite hard, um, that's a, quite a hard thing to pull off and it, and it doesn't mean everyone has to play their part, but that's the challenge. Michaela, thanks for talking to me today.